Um, for a talk on high performance ingestion with Python Swarm 64DB. Give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Um, so, uh, as you can hear, I have a little cold, unfortunately, but uh, this is not stopping me from talking here. Like, I love this conference. <laughs> um, so, please bear with me. I hope I don't have to cough too much, but um, I give my best. Um, yeah, I work for a, s a small little company named Swarm64. We are 25 now. It's a startup uh, based in Berlin, founded in Norway, Oslo, actually. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, high performance ingestion today. And before we start, I had a good laugh about this one. Five reasons why one switches from Python to Go. And um, there's a link on the bottom. It's a bit small, maybe. But um, if you want, you can read this uh, nice uh, article on Medium or Hacker Noon, however it's called. And basically, the number one reason why one would switch from Python to Go is it compiles to a single binary. That's pretty impressive, because Python doesn't compile at all, right? Number two. It has a static type system. Yeah, and the type system, by the way, is so static. If you're, some, if you're not including something, then it doesn't even compile and it yells at you because it's so much smarter than you. And uh, what I forgot here, we will also get static typing, right? So that's really cool. I think this is not a true reason. Number three, performance. Yeah, I thought this would be number one, actually, but who cares? Number four is you don't need a web framework for it. Okay, this is like, fine. Python, huh? batteries included, not check of all trades. When I need something, I install it, I have a library, I use it, and I mean, okay, fine. So this is not, this is like not generic reasons here, right? It's a bit, bit awkward. And number five is great IDE support in debugging. Okay, only one thing to say to that, let me show you my whim, right? So this is a bit ridiculous. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> but anyway, there was something on Telegram about VI settings or so. I'm not sure what it was that about, but this is uh, helping here, I would say. So let's dive into the topic after this little refresher here. Um, what does Swarm64 do now? No worries, I'm keeping this short. We will go straight to Python specific things and not talk about the company the whole uh, talk, but yeah. Swarm64 um, wants to provide a solution for big and fast data. What's this now? So assume you have some data source, and this data source is providing you data really quickly, like tremendous, tremendous amounts of data in a short, very short time. This is fast data in our terms, or how we call it at least. And then you have a SQL database. So we're not talking NoSQL here. We are talking about relational databases like they were used in the past. And by the way, they are still used. And by the way, they are still market leaders, actually. Um, so now the problem is you want to ingest this huge amount of data into your relational database. Might be easy, might not be easy, because those systems are not designed for something like that. But the next point is you also want to query on your data. So now imagine you have something like, I'm not sure, maybe 20 million data points a second flowing into your database, and then you want to query on top. And this is really difficult. <clears throat> Sorry. And now what you get from this, if you watch it in a complete, like if you watch a complete picture, then you can close the loop basically, um, and then you can, if you would be able to do this, you could perform actions on your query results, and then your actions could influence your data source, right? And this is exactly what we want to do. And to accomplish this, Swarm64 um, invented basically a plugin for popular databases, and this plugin hardware accelerates them, which means we use an FPGA, so you get an FPGA card, 
put it in your server system or whatever you have, and then you load our plugin, you have to transform your data a bit, at the moment at least it's like that, and then you're, uh, you get some nice speed ups, which we will, I'm going to show you later. Um, so now, for what is this useful? Actually, there's a um, myriad of things you can use this for, so I'm not going through the list. You can all read it later. Um, so there's, for instance, banking and finance. You have business intelligence, healthcare, transportation, and so on. So wherever in these days you have big amounts of data that are flowing fast in, we would provide you a solution to enable storage of this data and also querying it in real time or close to real time so that you can take actions on this. Now, a specific example is something where we would uh, go into trading and compliance. So, for instance, there is going to be a new law for banking where you have to log every single transaction you're making. Now, it sounds easy, but it isn't. So if you think about something like high performance trading where you are um, like in the millisecond sp space, which, uh, when your trades are done, then this generates exactly this l large amount of data in a short time. So for this particular example, what I've drawn you here is more like a system overview. Um, what, you, what you would do, or how would you build this? Um, there are companies out who are building specific uh, network cards that are also based on FPGAs. And those cards are able to basically listen on your Ethernet line, uh, and then they can filter on it as well, and then they can do something with the data. And for this trading, for instance, this is, um, this is what you want. Right? So you want to listen on your line where the trades are coming in. You want to do maybe deep packet inspection, and then you want to store specific results into your database. Um, and this actually is, because it's hardware, it is able to monitor the complete line. So if you're, for instance, talking about a 10 gigabit line, you're ending up with roughly 30 million packets a second that are flowing in under the circumstance that you're choosing the smallest packet rate, which nobody would do in practice, but that's kind of the upper limit. And then if you scale your line like you have 20 gigabits or 40 or 100 or 200, then you can do the math and you know how much packets you have to capture, right? And it's, Usually it's also not only one way, but it's maybe even in both ways you want to capture that line. And this is what you would use such a specific uh, network interface for. And then the big question is, what do you do with the data? Of course, you take your card, you take Swarm64DB, and then you ingest your data, and then you can query on it. And these are basically our requirements, right? So we have 30 million packets a second or rows a second flowing in, and then we have to query on them. For instance, you want to select specific time ranges. You want to say, okay, who, is the, who was the trader with the, with the most volume in the past 10 minutes or so? And if you now do the math with those 30 million rows a second over 10 minutes, then you know what we're talking about here. So wrapping this in like a single sentence would be, what is the goal? The goal is to ingest incoming data as fast as possible into a relational database management system getting as close as possible to 30 million rows a second with 40 bytes a row. So those 40 bytes a row, this is like, a, it's a bit arbitrary maybe, but it rather fits the case. This is basically five fields where each field is eight byte long or wide. Um, one field is, for instance, timestamp. Then you could have one field for the, the source of the trade, for instance. One field would be how much was the trade and then you have two fields remaining for who traded actually, like who is the one that um, um, made the purchase and who is the one uh, who received the purchase. So this is the goal. And interestingly now, um, this is a goal we want to achieve with Python because we don't want to compile. Um, we want to be, we want to have some flexibility and we think Python uh, provides us all this. So, who here believes that this can be done at all? I want to see some hands. Well, not many. Come on, guys. Okay, fair enough. So, who believes that this can be done with Postgres? One, 
two, three? Sorry? Yeah, yeah to, the, to the biggest extent, base. So you would have the main functionality of Postgres, yes. Let's put it like this. Okay, it's getting more. So, and who believes that this can be done with Postgres and Python? Okay, good, 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 good. So you can go, you know the talk already. <laughs> <clears throat> Fine, so that's the goal. Now, how do we get there? For that, we have some assumptions, of course. And the assumption is that uh, your data is first quickly available. That means you don't have to generate it, you get it from somewhere. And the second assumption is that the I.O. is your bottleneck, actually. And if you take all these assumptions and you would do this in a sequential manner, then you would get the, the graph that's here in the bottom. And I try to highlight this a bit. So basically, you have your Python program, right? And then you have a certain, uh, let's call it data flow. And uh, the green parts are always stuff that is CPU intense. So now I just said the data is quickly available. Um, but um, for, the, for the sake of the example, uh, let's assume you have to do at least something on the data. Sometimes you have to transform it a bit. But yeah, so this is only a fraction of the problem, actually. And then when you go over to the ingest, you again have some part that is rather, say, CPU heavy because you have to transform your or encode your data before it can be ingested. And then the biggest chunk is the ingestion itself. And this is basically copying it into the database and uh, waiting until your copy returns. Uh, that also means whenever I'm going to show uh, numbers now, the measurement itself is done on the ingest part, right? So we are not taking care about how long does, did it take to, to get the data or generate the data because we assume the data is already there. Right? So that's the whole point. So now, this is of course not, not how somebody would implement this because it's sequential, it's going to be slow. You're basically dependent on, on your whole chain there. Like the faster the library is, the faster every, every part is, the faster you would get with that approach. So now we do the following. We think, okay, fine, we have Python, we have multi-threading. We know uh, multi-threading in Python is a little bit different. So we assume that the, um, that the thread management is able to, to see that there's, a, that there's basically an I.O. going on and then it can switch threads to the next one and prepare it and so on. So what you would ideally get is this graph here. And so out of an ideal perspective, you would get some decent speed up, right? But, oh my God. The problem here is that your overhead is so large that you're not getting this ideal um, picture basically and it does not scale in the end. So nice idea, nice try. Close, no cigar. Next idea, multiprocessing. And um, this is again the ideal picture, of course, because if you spawn no multiple processes, you don't have the, like we are assuming we don't have the problem with the uh, GIL, uh, and therefore we assume it runs as parallel as it can, and then therefore the more parallel connections I make to my database, the faster I can ingest, right? Unfortunately, this is not true. The problem here is that you still have a large amount of overhead. You still have interference with the GIL, especially when it comes to spawning the process, controlling the processes you've spawned, and uh, the more processes you're spawning, the harder it gets, and so on and so forth. So long story short, does not scale. Yeah, so now we are kind of out of ideas. Maybe it's not going to work simply. So what to do? We go back to slide number two, and the guy from slide two says, yeah, low, come on, switch to Go. You're wasting 100 lines of code, and if you switch to Go now, you're not wasting anymore, but you are going to get your results. And the response to that is simple, simply, uh, I go give uh, Async I.O. a try. And Async I.O. being the new kid on the block, this is really nice now. Because I was myself Googling for this problem a bit, and then um, I stumbled over this one here, AsyncPG. Now what's that? AsyncPG is an implementation of 
library to connect to Postgres, as the name implies. But the nice thing here is the R4 actually um, re-implemented the protocol. So you're not dependent on like PsychoPG2 where it uses the C++ or C library from Postgres, but you're having your own protocol implementation, which is again uh, using async IO, and therefore it is very efficient. So it's still a C library in the backend basically, but your calls to the library, they are uh, highly efficient and this is much, much faster. And this is what this um, nice benchmark wants to show us. However, the problem here is, well, okay, it beats Go, fine, right? So like we are here at uh, say 900 rows a second roughly, uh, 900,000 rows a second, excuse me, and uh, Go is much below this, like, like 650,000 or so. so. That's quite nice. Mm, this is the nice part about this. This is what, what gets your attraction basically, because if you're going to the GitHub page, you're, this is the first thing you are going to see. So now if you dig it a bit deeper, they are going to understand that this is actually a synthetic benchmark. And that means in this case, it is only one byte per row. And this is, it's pretty useless. Like what do you do with one byte per row? This is a single column, it's a single integer. And yeah, fine. Uh, if you remember, I talked about 40 bytes a row, where you would have five columns with maybe five big integers. So this is quite different. And the ugly thing here is, it's scaling is absolutely unclear. So this benchmark is telling you something, but not the truth, basically. Nevertheless, it's enough to try it out. So what do we do now is the following. We go back to, uh, we go back to the sketchboard, and we think of a structure, how we would use this in an efficient way. So now, this rings a bell, right? Because this is the same picture as for the multi-threading case. The thing is here now, this is much more efficient. Why? Because you're removing almost all the overhead. You don't have this thread management overhead anymore suddenly because you're using an event loop. Um, you don't have this protocol overhead from PsychoPG2 because you're using a different implementation which reduces that overhead again. So this is highly efficient. Question is how efficient it is with 40 bytes a row. And this is shown in this picture. And you see we are here at 2.25 million rows a second. And this is really, really awesome. So what you see on the graph to, to explain this a bit more is like on the, on the uh, X axis you have how many concurrent ingestion tasks you have. And on the Y axis you have of course how many rows per second are flowing through the system. So as you can see it scales a bit. Like of course if you have only, if you have only one ingestor or like one task then you're back to the sequential thing at the end. So you're firing one, you're waiting until it completes, you're firing the next one and so on. If you have two, you start two at a time basically, wait until they complete and then again starting them. Um, so in the jump between one and two uh, concurrent ingestion tasks, is, it's quite a bit. It's roughly 500,000 uh, K packets or rows a second. And then the more you give it, the theory would be the better you get. But as you see, it's capping off, uh, off at this uh, 2.25 billion. <laughs> Nevertheless, it's quite impressive because this is a real use case, you know. So this is something where you get these 40 bytes of data and you can make actually use of them in the end. Now, this is of course way below what I set as a goal. So, and before we continue with that, I I'm, want to tell you a bit more about Swamp64, how this uh, database works. So, and then we can dive into that part a bit more. So what we do, as I said, is um, we provide hardware acceleration. And you can think of this whole system as kind of um, a yeah, um, combination of different parts. So what you, of course, have and what we value very high is that the customer keeps its data. So in the beginning, in the first iteration of our product, we decided to do the storage on the FPGA directly, and we, were, we are getting away from this now, like in the latest release, we are storage agnostic, you can do whatever you want, you can have your NFS, ZFS, you can have a RAID, uh, you can have whatever you, whatever you want. Right? Um, point is though, it works best if you use uh, flash storage like SSDs, NVMEs, it's not so good on HDDs, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a different story. 
So now to enable this, you essentially would get a card from us. This is like a standard Intel hardware. And uh, you plug it in your server or your workstation even. Then you would load the driver, you would load the runtime. And um, basically this is a plugin. This is what I said earlier with uh, respect to Postgres. So you're keeping your Postgres functionality in the end. Um, you can do everything you can imagine in SQL, right? From the easiest select count star whatever to really big, big weird queries. And we've seen a lot of them. Like we've seen queries with two, three thousand lines of query code actually. And this all seamlessly works. Whether you're getting acceleration or not, this is a different story because we still, um, you're still optimizing the whole system. But this is what you get. And it's not only, not only working with Postgres, but we are also going to support MySQL and MariaDB. This is in the works right now. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so it's pretty, um, pretty tight with your, with your existing system. You don't have to learn something new. That's the idea. So from a processing point of view, what the question now is, of course, what does, what does your FPGA do? Uh, it's, it's sitting in a machine, looks nice, you know. Um, but that's not the truth. So what we do is actually the FPGA does compression and decompression to a large extent. Um, that helps, of course, saving I.O. bandwidth. Um, we do also some filtering. It's like if you have something in your SQL query which we uh, recognize, uh, then we can push this down to the FPGA. Like you have some, for instance, a where clause with where you would want to restrict your time span on the query you're running. And this can be pushed down to the FPGA. So the FPGA knows about this. And the moment the data is flowing in, the FPGA is able to filter that. And then you will get only a reduced result set, which makes it even faster and saves you CPU cores. And this is, um, this is um, highly optimized for that. Plus, what also comes into play here is uh, we are not using the storage layer of Postgres, but we have our own, which is already indicated by the compression decompression here. But our storage is uh, optimized with respect to which columns you want to have optimized. So the idea behind this is you define what kind of columns you want to optimize when you create your table. So in our example, for instance, <coughs> With the trading, out of those five columns, you would optimize three. Those three are, for instance, the timestamp, the ticker symbol, and, for instance, the value. So now the data is stored when it flows in with respect to those three columns. So if you query on those three columns, it is kind of ensured that you always get only the data you want. And it's not like Postgres, where you can put an index on anything. Um, but this putting an index only optimizes the knowledge about where something is and not where it is stored in reality, so it still has to gather scatter, basically. And we are doing this uh, in chunks, so we can, our I.O. is more efficient, basically, from the machine, and with the compression, it also saves you bandwidth. So this is the whole idea about that one. <clears throat> and um, by using this, we are now able to uh, improve those, those ingestion speeds and also the query speeds, which I'm not going to show here um, because, yeah, it's, it's more about the ingestion side at the moment. Um, so, how the same benchmark now, how does this look with Swarm 64DB? We are at release 1.2 at the moment. Um, again, we are comparing now to Postgres 9.6. This is uh, optimized. Like the configuration is optimized, of course. It's not that we, we don't want to be unfair against Postgres, of course. Um, we are using, still using async PG, and we have those 40 bytes per row. And this looks now like this. Um, as you see, we are uh, at 3.4 million rows a second peak now. So this is uh, quite a lot more already, <coughs> but still far away from what I, what I wanted. So I bet, my bet is now we can get that much, much faster. The question is now how do we do this? And this is um, where, the, where the second idea comes into play, which is about how do we scale in the end and how do we scale that approach? And if you um, think about the previous slide with the multiprocessing, um, this is an idea like we would use multiprocessing to scale 
but um, as we saw, that it did not scale because of those overhead problems we had. Now we, but now we are completely on async I.O. basically, and luckily there's another library which is A.I.O. processing, which does the same as the multiprocessing library but with async I.O. So now we are getting to this. So what we get here is basically we combine those two approaches. We combine the multi-threading approach with uh, an approach of multiprocessing. So when you start the benchmark, basically you define how many processes I want to have, 2, 4, 8, 16, 21, whatever. And then you tell each process how many worker threads it should spawn. And those worker threads are the ones in the middle in the sub-process then. So now the, um, the nice thing about this one is, as I said, we completely or almost completely remove those thread, thread management overhead. And this leads now to the following. So first again, um, Postgres. This is the same Postgres again, but with this methodology now. So you're not using now, as you're still using multiple connections to the database, of course. They are concurrent, but now they are also parallel, right? So that means <clears throat> we would expect Postgres to scale a bit better, but this is not the case, unfortunately. But now we look at uh, Swarm 64DB, and this looks like this. So what you have here in this graph in the bottom is, uh, I'm showing the numbers in a moment, uh, in the bottom you basically see one by one, two by one, and so on, and the first number is how many processes, the second number is how many worker threads you had. Uh, and the numbers are like this. So we're here at 24.5 million rows a second. And this is really tremendous, um, especially when you do this with Python, right? And this is not compiled. This is um, pure code. It's 100 lines of code only. Actually, it's 90 if you remove the white space in the comments. So it's 90 lines of code. And now, the, now comes the icing on the cake. This is Go. And we are beating Go. And I find this amazing, actually. This is really cool. And let me tell you one thing. The Go code is uh, three times as big as the Python code and compiles, right? It compiles. And if you want to change a single line and you're not importing something, then it will yell at you and you're, ah, yeah, okay, I'm commenting that out. And, right? So thumbs up for Python. This is really awesome. I like this result. Um, so this is still not those 30 million rows. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not able to show you the 30 million. We are still working on that because the point is now, uh, the bottleneck is not Python here. The bottleneck is the database. So we are uh, uh, working very hard to get uh, the rest on that. Um, there are several approaches, like you could, for instance, start uh, running multiple tables. So it shows now, at this point, at this high ingestion speed, that um, Postgres itself becomes the bottleneck, unfortunately. So um, this is um, so there's much much overhead in uh, converting the rows basically into our for into our format, which is Postgres induced. Um, and um, an, I, an approach to that is that you use, for instance, two tables. But this is then also that you use n tables. But unfortunately, this is also not scaling very very far. So there's a lot of work to do still to get to those 30 million rows. And another aspect is the hardware. So um, what we're using at the moment is a PCI Express card with, uh, with an X8 connector. Um, and this is like, um, yeah, it's the, the throughput for that is not as high as we wanted, but we are still optimizing that. So there's more to come here. But I, again, I'm, I'm excited about this result. Uh, I'm also excited that I can show this to you because, um, yeah, end of story, basically. So Pythonic. I love this. I love this that we beat Go on that one. And it's not a synthetic benchmark. Let me please uh, say this again. It's not synthetic. This is a real use case. And we've been with a customer who wants this. And they have seen this, basically. Um, so it's, it's, it's real. End of story. So first thing to note, a famous, uh, famous Python minister once told me you never get Python to ingest that fast. 
I proved her wrong. This is uh, it's nice. It's a bit mean maybe, but it's still nice. It feels good. Um, so how do you get to that? You don't get to that with the traditional approaches like multiprocessing, multithreading. You get to that with async I.O. libraries, which reduces the overhead highly. I uh, think there's much more to come now. This is like uh, amazing times we are in with Python. Um, but it is also important that you think about your problem. And I think we've heard this today in the, uh, in the keynote. Like, if it's not scaling or if you are unable to throw more hardware at it, then think about your algorithm or how you implemented that. And that's exactly also a key point here. So it's not enough to simply use async IO, think a bit about it and maybe say, okay, nice concept, it's concurrent, it's not what I wanted, or maybe I don't even understand it, so I'm throwing it away, stop, uh, stop using it. Um, I think this is the wrong way. So think about the algorithms and of course your uh, your backend must be fast enough. This is um, and as I said, the the bottleneck is still the database at the moment, which we which is the backend in this case. <clears throat> right, uh, that's it. One more thing from my side: we are hiring. We are 25. We need to grow. We need to double our size next year minimum. So if you're interested in working with cool database technology and Python, maybe a bit of Go or C++ or any language you like, come to us. Um, we are always looking for it. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian, for the talk. We now have plenty of time for questions. Yeah. Just briefly, um, in the comparison, I didn't see PG Loader. I assume you've looked at PG Loader because the guy who wrote that had the same problem. He used to do it in Python and switch to Lisp to, for better parallelization. You mean that one? Or which comparison? No, initially. And, the, and it, the, the last comparison is interesting, of course, that Go seems to beat Python in, until you get to 16 cores, but. That one? No, no, very yeah. early on, your first. Y yes. Ah, the benchmark. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, can you repeat the question? Sorry. Are you familiar with PG Loader? No. Okay, it's. I have it, to say no. I'm sorry. Uh, it, it's okay. It's written by I think a Belgian guy who initially did it in Python and had mm -hmm. to switch to Lisp, mm -hmm. better parallelization. Mm -hmm. um, and I assume all this stuff is Postgres has got no constraints on the data you're loading. No. So um, what we did with Postgres is we uh, tried to configure it as optimal as we could for ingestion workloads and also for query load workloads. But this is a little hard because either one or the, or the other. Uh, we, we had some help by a company called Second Quadrant. Mm -hmm. They are helping with Postgres a lot. I think they are even extending it. So they helped us on that one. So that we, we would assume that the Postgres config is quite optimal itself. But um, the problem is uh, really how it stores the data, how it, how it munches it, basically. Another problem, which I was not talking about until now, is um, this data we ingested in Postgres had not a single index. So if you, have, if you put indices on top, you're not getting above 100k rows a second or so. This is really difficult. And this is what we want to solve with our solution, actually. Okay, well, yeah, the classic is drop, then add after you've done it, but if you're doing all the time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and would a column this door help? Um, yeah, we tried, uh, we tried MariaDB columnar, which is pretty new. Um, hadn't so good, uh, so much good results. We have been in the talks with, um, uh, with, a big, with two big OEMs, actually, and they were hinting us in, at, at different libraries, like, uh, what was it, Flink or so? And I think Flink was able to do 300 gigabytes per day of data per server. And with this one, we, we would be able to do several hundred terabytes on one machine. So this is, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's quite, quite different. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? 
Uh, so have you considered not using Python objects, but using NumPy or Pandas objects, where we can very easily pass you know, gigabytes per second? Yeah, but the point here is that you have to store it. You, have, you want to persistency in the end. So it's not about ETL or about um, what, what you showed today in the morning, right, with the nice graph, which I like, by the way. So thanks that you're asking something. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but this is about persistency. And as I said, with this trading thing with the banks, for instance, so you really have to log every single transaction they're making. You don't want to lose the data, and you want to have it on disk. And this is absolutely important. And uh, to my knowledge, there is uh, no, no system which can do this in a single machine. Okay, so what I'm hearing from you is that it's very important for you to do it row by row as it comes in. You don't want to collect maybe 100 rows at a time and submit them all at one time. Well, it's um, internally the system does, uh, um, does batches, of course, and this is how, also how we measure it, so sorry for misunderstanding. Um, what we are doing is we are ingesting 100,000 rows a second, uh, sorry, per batch, so we are chunking it, but it shows also that the data is flowing so fast in that this is like it's, it's nothing. And uh, as I said earlier, like on this, um, on the slide with the use case, this is a real product that exists, like this network interface card with the FPGA, and they can do up to 200 gigabytes a second of Ethernet lines, and this is like, it's, it's crazy what is flowing in there. Um, it just, so I think often like with network packets or with many lots of data, many data sources, that it comes in sort of a very you know, C-like way, it's maybe it's structs or it's, it's you know, columnar in some sense. And in Python, we often we unpack it into mm -hmm. Python objects, which mm -hmm. would be very expensive. And then Postgres actually stores it very similar to how it was coming on the network card, and they repack it into the same way. Mm -hmm. This can sometimes be expensive. I think um, Uwe gave a talk yesterday about Arrow. I think the talk after this is also about these sorts of technologies. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> um, I think the point here is that um, the idea is, well, yeah, so the idea behind this whole thing is you get the data in, you don't look much at it, but you store it right away. And then, given our fast query capabilities as well, you can get the data very quickly out again. So what is imaginable is that you have something like a streaming uh, pandas or uh, whatever you want, connected to the database, getting new data every second again out of this huge chunk, but maybe even pre-filtered, and then you can make your statistics on top of this. And the database is going to help you with that a lot, I think. Um, you mentioned it's so important to have it on one node, and I'm wondering if you put like, I don't know, gigabytes per second or even more, yep. um, isn't that in the end that your node will run out of disk space in a couple hours or days, and then, so, so yeah, I'm kind of wonder, wondering what you want to do with it. Yeah, so it's absolutely correct what you're saying. Um, of course, um, it is not the end to have it on one node. The, uh, we are looking into several approaches to, to do horizontal scaling, for instance. Um, <clears throat> there's like Postgres XL and there's uh, Greenplum to only mention some things for, for Postgres, but there are more things for other databases. Um, so there's definitely uh, horizontal scaling happening. And uh, on the other hand, if you don't want to have the, um, the computational power of multiple nodes, but you only have one node, then what is, what is becoming your bottleneck is the storage. And there are also systems to extend storage, like uh, there's uh, Cobyte, for instance. They have linearly scalable storage, so you just put in more disks, and the database can make use of this, actually. I have a, a rookie question, maybe. Uh, so if, this, if I have a, a database and a uh, an FPGA flying <coughs> around, why would I ever not use it? Sorry, come again. Why would I ever not use the Swarm 64DB? Is there any downsides, any limitations to it? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> we are at the moment focusing on uh, everything that's IoT, like or easily structured data. We, will ha we have some problems with unstructured data, but there are also ways to, um, to handle this. And what we are actively working on is that we want to um, 
we want to provide more like for business intelligence tools, sorry, <coughs> which is rather, rather difficult <coughs> because they're using a lot of joints, for instance. So our joint support is not that great at the moment. You can do joints, of course, but if you have a um, very join heavy query, you would want to go ahead and use uh, temporary tables or like CDs, how they call them, and then you want to you want to do the joins, <coughs> sorry, on those CTEs basically. So this is the downside at the moment, but um, it's an ongoing research topic. Any more questions? Going once, going twice. So let's give a warm hand to Sebastian again. Thank you for the talk. Thank you.